Welcome. It is March the 5th. We are so excited to have you here. It's been a fun start. We have been locking in and out trying to figure out what's going on with our Wi-Fi, but you know what? God is good, and we just welcome you all with us today. I want to just say, if you ever want to be part of this uh, Created for His Glory, please contact vineyardconnections at outlook.com, and we will send you uh, a, an email link so you can join us. We meet 2 o'clock Pacific time, 4 o'clock Central, and 5 o'clock Eastern time every Sunday. And again, afterwards, we always share. We have time to pray. We have time to, to talk about what we've shared. And it's just a community, um, a church community that we love to be part of. So welcome. And, and Dave, if you want to start with a prayer, and we'll start straight into it today. Yeah, as long as we don't freeze up, we're good. Yeah. All right. All right, we will pray. Father, we just bless you because you're so good. As Jesus taught us, hallowed be your name. Your name is above everything else, and it's marvelous and wonderful. So we come to you. We commit this time to you, Father. We ask for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide, to open our hearts and minds, to let us hear what you have us to hear, Father. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We commit this time to you, and we bless you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. We've been doing so many things, I forgot what I was going to teach about. I went up and down the stairs too many times. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. You had to be on the on the Zoom meeting to understand. But uh, Dave, do you want me to start with this or you want to start with your sort of summary of righteousness and then I can share a little bit? I'll start and I'll let okay. you, you cut in as you so mm -hmm. aptly do at just the right time. <laughs> I appreciate it, Amelia. Yeah. So what were we talking about? We left off. We've been talking about faith righteousness and how important it is and one of the things that we said last week was that and the week before uh, righteousness is not a feeling it's who you are in christ so if you're trying to feel righteous or get some kind of a sensation from knowing that you're righteous it's not going to happen immediately righteousness is who you are in christ and i was pondering this and, and asking the lord how do i get this across because i, I want to I want to drive this nail so deep into the timber of life that it can't be pulled out. Righteousness, you were born into it. And, and the example that I got was royalty. And the only real royalty that we know, whether you want to call them that or not, is over there in England. In England and that's the royals. And to be a royal, you have to be born into that family. And if you're born into it, you don't become a royal. You are a royal because of your birthright it's your birthright you're born into it your parents are royal you were royal that's what they tell us anyway but that's the way it happens you're born into it you don't get assigned royalty you are that and we're born the word of god tells us in first john 5 4 whatsoever is born of god let's think about that statement for a minute whatsoever is born of god so you're the offspring of god first peter tells us we're born again of the word of god you're the offspring of god in christ so you have the character and nature of your father residing in you and he's righteous he is righteous righteousness remember this is not a feeling it's who you are in christ and, and i use the example of we're all human beings, but you ever get up every one morning and decide, I don't feel like a human today. You can say that until you turn blue. I'm sorry, you're human. You are not going to change what you are. Your DNA has created you to be a human, formed and fashioned you to be human. That's what you are. You can cut parts off and sew them on wherever you want. You're still a human. That's it. It's not going to change. I don't care what you say. You're a human. And you and I are born of God when we have accepted Christ as our Savior and God baptized us into Christ. We're integrated with him and his righteousness is our righteousness. You were born of him. Now, I want to I want to go back over our couple of key scriptures that we've been banging on for the last little while, sounding the alarm. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 we keep going over this and I'm, and then it's important that we do and that mm -hmm. says how can two walk together unless they be agreed and this is something we need to get it down in your heart that we can't walk with God unless we agree with his word 
We can't sit with him face to face and have a chat and him go for a walk with us in the garden of heaven. Not just yet. That's coming one day. But right now he's given up his word. So we have to read his word and agree with what he said in his word about us. And if we agree with his word, what he said about us, then we can walk with him. And that word walk, you know, it, it opens up to fellowship. It opens up to, to mean so many things. It's not just walking around. It means how can we abide together? How can we dwell together unless we be agreed? So that's one of our key scriptures. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? And so we're going to say from now on, I agree with God's word and what he says about me because I'm going to walk in fellowship with my father. So I'm going to agree with what he says. Right? And the next thing we wanted to say was in Isaiah 53 verse 1 where God asked a question about his work that he's done in Christ who has believed our report who's going to believe the magnificent thing that I've done for them with my son in and through my son who has believed now it's an interesting term the word believed doesn't mean believe or who's going to believe it says who has believed past tense past tense who has believed meaning who's walking in what i've done for them in my son we talked about this it's going to back the bus up a little bit if you have faith in god which we do god has dealt to the every every man the measure of faith romans 12 tells us that we've got the measure of faith paul says in galatians that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. That means two things. He lives by the faith righteousness that Jesus believed for him, that gift that he gave him. And two, he lives by the faith of Christ because Christ is the head of the body. And the head controls all the actions of the body, sends out the signals and, and tells the body what to do and how to do it. So the head is responsible to supply all the faith needed for the body to do everything it needs to do. The body does not supply that. The head decides who gets what and where and makes sure that it's distributed among the members. Right? So let's, let's get through that. Who has believed our report? Isaiah 53. Past tense. Who's living in it? Who is bold enough to stand up and walk in the finished work that I have done for you in Christ? That's an amazing, amazing scripture. So remember that faith causes us, if we have true faith, to believe the word of God. Because if we have faith in God, we believe everything that he says to us and about us. Because I have faith in him, I trust him. Because I'm trusting him when he says something to me, I will believe it. And the word believe means if I believe what he has said to me, I must put action to what I believe. You're getting that. So in this case, he's saying to us, I have made you my righteousness in Christ. Do you believe me? And you say yes or no. Yes, I do. Okay. Then if you believe me, that means you're going to have to order your actions in line with what that word is telling you. You're going to have to change the way you think, the way you act, and the way you talk about who you are in Christ. And it is a choice. It is a choice, like everything else about our soul. Our soul is the part in the middle, and then we have our flesh that's talking to us all the time. And once we're born again and we have the spirit of the living God in us, our soul has to choose. Am I listening to the flesh that says, you're not worth it? What makes you think that you're righteous? It starts to put doubt because that's the other thing. I mean, a question I was going to ask was, why would people not believe that they're righteous? Why would they not? Because why would people not believe that? Because righteous? they look at their actions. Now, that's that's a good question. So let's 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 dig in on that one. All right, what part of you is born of God? What part of you was regenerated at the new birth? What part of you? your spirit so righteousness is in the spirit realm That's it's it. in your spirit in christ uh, ephesians 4 24 says that we were created in true righteousness and holiness after god or like god you were created in the same image of him in the spirit realm so that is where you are righteous in the spirit realm 
All right. So we talked about, Amelia just brought it up, spirit and soul. Let's go over that for another minute here, because there's other people that are watching this that haven't been involved in all this. When before you were born again, your soul and your flesh were joined together like this. You went about doing whatever the Bible says, whatever your carnal desires were, you, you went for the lust of the flesh and of the mind, just whatever felt good, that's what I'm going to do to survive before you it were born again. To do it. Yeah, the old feels good, do it thing. Yeah. So anyway, that's the way you were. When you were born again and the light, life and love of God came into your spirit, the righteousness of God, your soul is ripped out of the flesh and now is in neutral. It's taken out. It has a choice now to follow after the spirit or follow after the flesh. That's the privilege that God gave you. If we go over to Ezekiel chapter 36, and I can quote it to you. I'll give you my version of it. G, the God the Father says, I will put a new spirit within you. I will take out your dead spirit. I'll put a new spirit within you. And he said, I will take out your heart of flesh, your heart of stone out of your flesh and put a heart of flesh in you. He said, I'll take that heart of stone out of you. What was he referring to in Ezekiel chapter 36? He's talking about the ability to believe and trust him. When your old heart was joined to your flesh, it didn't trust God, didn't want anything to do with God, because as far as your flesh was concerned, God's just horning in on your good times and what you want to do and the way you want to do it. So he took that stony heart out that didn't want to yield to God and put a new heart in you that is capable of yielding to the spirit and flowing with God. So righteousness is in the spirit realm. He gave you a new heart so that you could believe and trust him. So now your soul is sitting in neutral. You've got your flesh on this side. You've got your spirit on this side. Look who's in the middle. Me. I'm right in the middle. Here's my spirit. Here's my soul. Now I have a choice. Paul talks about putting on the new man and taking off the old man. Colossians and Ephesians. He makes reference to that. Put on the new man, which after Christ is fashioned in true, right, true righteousness and holiness. And the other scripture, of course, is be led by the spirit of God always a choice be led it isn't something you automatically get that because you have the right spirit of righteousness that's in you that you suddenly all of a sudden will be walking la la la, la i'm always walking by the spirit you're led by the spirit of the living god because it's always a choice so there we go so now we're making a choice so what happens if you ask the question what happens when i don't feel righteous or i don't think i'm doing right and i don't think that i have right standing with God at that point you're looking at your flesh and you're dealing with your mind yeah. you're not dealing with the spiritual realm you're not dealing with that over over in um, the book of uh, Ephesians Paul asked us not to walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of your mind he said don't walk in the vanity of your mind he said don't walk in the empty uselessness that the other Gentiles walk in they think about foolish nothingness all the time he said, walk in with your mind geared up to and, and believing and receiving the truth about who you are in Christ. He said, don't walk like they do. You're not like them anymore. You are a new creation in Christ, recreated in true righteousness and true holiness. So righteousness is in the spirit realm. So if you're looking at your flesh and you're listening to your vocabulary, until your mind is renewed, you're going to be doing things and saying things that are not too line that line up too good with the word and the will of God until you learn how to walk away from that, how to turn away from that, till you mature and grow in the Lord. So I want to jump in on this because I know Dave talked about it last week, but again, like Dave says, we need to hear it again and again until we truly, fully get it and understand and are walking in it. One of the things that I always know that I struggled with before really fully grasping that I'm righteous, I love how Dave's putting it is righteousness is in the spiritual realm not in the physical carnal and not in the solical which is my mind my will and my emotions so because it's in the spiritual realm and because i now have the spirit of god in me it's always mine so what we end up doing and the reason i ask that question is because that's what we do we start to doubt that we're righteous when we've done something wrong and then the enemy plays on that and he makes us doubt that we are in right standing with the father, which is another way of saying righteousness. Righteousness equals I'm in right standing with the father. So 
if my sin and what I'm doing doesn't change the righteousness of the spirit of God in me, then I'm always in right standing with him. However, we talked about this last week as well. And we talked about what if, maybe you want to jump on this one again, but what if I'm in knowing sin, I'm actually in disobedience and my conscience is troubling me because the Bible talks about that, that if your conscience troubles you, your heart troubles you, you cannot have communion with the Father. So that is that is different too. I don't lose my righteousness, but I do lose my ability to commune with the Father when I'm walking in um, disobedience. Willing, willing sin, disobedience. Exactly. Not because we can all sin and do things and not even be aware. We're talking about willful disobedience. Uh, when you're doing something that you know is against God's word and the Father has convicted you, then you're going to get into trouble with your heart and your conscience, and then you're not going to be able to have that ability to speak to him. However, you still don't lose your righteousness. That never goes. The spirit of God is still in you. He's That's, still righteous. Because remember. And he'll convict you in that righteousness. That's how he convicts you. Remember that. Because that spirit's in you. You were made righteous. You are not, you don't have it. Like I shared last week when I pulled out that credit card. It's not a get out of jail card that you use when you're in trouble. It's who you are in Christ. And God made you righteous. He made you righteous in Christ and gave you Christ's righteousness because he knew and he knows that we're just dust and flesh. And as we're growing and maturing, we're going to make mistakes and we commit sins that are, that are, are of omission and of commission. Yeah. And for us, really, in, in the body of Christ, for born-again believers who love the Lord, Paul said that anything that is not of faith is sin. And you can back that bus up all the way to the top of the hill and get out and have a look around and realize what that really means. That means every time that you do get in sin, it's because you're not trusting the Lord to look after you in the need or the area of your life that you're about to do something stupid in. Yeah, you right. think you have to go and do it for yourself. And so you're going to do it according to what your flesh wants or what the pressure of life is putting on you because you don't believe the Father will look after you. So that's why anything that's not of faith is sin, because if you're trusting the Father, you're going to go to him. You're going to ask him what I need to do, and you're going to trust him and let him work it out in your life. Remember, Corinthians says that there's no temptation that has taken you that not is not common to man. And with every temptation, God makes a way of escape. Always. Mm -hmm. See, he's got this thing looked after if we want to go his way. So you talked about what does God do if you're in disobedience and you're, and you're in sin? Well, we talked about that when we talked about when the Lord chastens you. And we found out in Job 36, chapter 36 and verse 10, it says this is God's first run at you when you're when you're when you're messing up and you know it and, you, and you're in the wrong place. It says he openeth also the ear to discipline. And he commanded that they return from their iniquity. So the first thing he's going to do, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you. He's going to convict you of righteousness. There you go. That's it. He's going to convict you. Listen, you're righteous. And what you're doing doesn't line up with who you are. Paul said that over in the book of Ephesians, that we should walk worthy of the calling wherewith we are called. And I used to wonder, what is he saying that for? What does he mean? He means that you're created in the righteous image of God. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the holiness of God in you. You are a born again child of God. You are the representation of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You are royalty in the kingdom of heaven. And he said, you're to learn to walk worthy of who and what you are yeah. in Christ. Oh, wow. I am just the anointing of the father is here just on that word alone. He wants us to get this. You see, that's been our biggest trouble for any of you. I'm sure I'm not the only person here that went into places in my background of getting it wrong, of, of being wounded and going the wrong way and making bad choices. And, you know, the father convicted me in that spirit of righteousness. And I heard him say to me one day, this is not who you are. And that is what God says to those he loves. That's the conviction of the Father. That's what he wants us to understand. 
I want you to know who you are, because if you know who you are, you're going to live by that standard of who you are. You're not going to try and be something you're not. You're not going to be pulled by your flesh because all of a sudden you know who you are. And the identity is what the enemy is always trying to steal from us. He wants us to doubt that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Here we go. Good stuff. Now here, Paul, Paul had this problem with the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said something to them. He said, where are we here? Um, Brethren, I could not speak unto you, chapter 3, sorry, verse 1. I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but unto carnal, because you're babes in Christ. Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. 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 Big ouch. And unfortunately, most of us have lived in that ouch, ouch stage for the longest time. He says the Holy Spirit, let's back that up. And verse 12 of chapter 2, he says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Now listen to this. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So he says, We've got the Holy Ghost so he can show us all these things. And he said, I wanted to talk to you as mature, but I couldn't because you're still carnal. You're still squabbling over who's the better preacher, who's the better teacher, and who I follow and who you follow. And you can just follow that one through all the way. You know, I'm this and I'm that. Instead of going to the Lord and saying, what do you say about this situation? And comparing. And comparing, growing and maturing. And one other place. I got to bring this up now. I'm sorry. He's been trying to bring this for the last two weeks, so I'm sure it's going to get out there today. <laughs> While we're on the reason why we have stumbled over this and we have a problem with this, I'm trying to remove these rocks off the road so you can run down this road called righteousness and not trip over this stuff anymore. Hebrews chapter six. Well, let's let's back up to verse in chapter five. And verse 12, this is what Paul said to the Hebrews. For when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as need milk and not strong meat. For everyone that use it, uses milk, now ready, are you ready for this? Is unskillful in the word of righteousness oh, he's yeah. obeyed so why do i have problems with righteous righteousness and, and i have a problem understanding it because i haven't been founded in the doctrines the principal doctrines of christ i've let them go he said you've let them go he didn't say you never had them but you forgot about them and you're basing your walk in christ on other things that are not a foundation he talked about that in Corinthians. He said, I build on no other foundation but Christ. That's the one I build on. Yeah. He said, I don't build on anything else. I build on him, him crucified, him resurrected, Christ Christ and him glorified. That's what I build my whole doctrine on. So he said, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. For strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, who those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We can come to the place where your physical, natural body will discern what's going on around you because your soul learning to walk in righteousness and in the spirit it will pick up the garbage going on around you long before you even know here what's going yeah. on. You'll know what's going on in the spirit realm around you. Now, chapter 6, verse 1. Let's just dig into this a little bit. Let's get the bulldozer out and get some rocks off the road here. Let's clear this path. Ephesians 6, 1. No, nope. Hebrews 6, 1. Oh, Hebrews, pardon me. Thank you. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, Okay, the word doctrine is not a theological giant. It means teachings. Teachings, that's all that word means, teachings. Teachings, the teachings of Christ. 
Therefore, leaving the principles of the teachings of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Oh, so he's saying, okay, we want to go past this. We're going, we're going to get off the, the principles. But now he's about to list out what those principal doctrines are. Right. Now ask yourself, as I read through this, do I know and understand anything about these six things? There's six of them. You ready? Okay. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's number one. What is that talking about? It's talking about what we're dealing with right now. Works righteousness works. as opposed to faith righteousness. Dead works were trying to please God so that you'd be righteous in his sight. He said those were dead works. You never could be righteous in his sight by your own works. And now we're repenting from that. He said we're changing our mind. We're going to think in the opposite way. And we're going into faith righteousness because he's provided it for us. We're not going to think like that anymore. And that's I'm going to just, one. yeah, and I want to just jump in on that because that's kind of what we were talking about before. And the original question was, why would somebody not feel that they're righteous? Because they're in works. They're looking at themselves. And that is, if you tie it in with religion and a religious mindset, we will look at ourselves and say, I haven't done this or I'm not doing this. And look at my life over here. And the enemy will point all the things that are wrong with you. And that is works righteousness, well, not faith. Faith righteousness says you wake up and you say, Father, I thank you that you're so amazing and you're so good. And you put your spirit in me. And then I believe that no matter what I'm feeling and no matter what I'm doing. Remember, believing is acting on what you believe. <laughs> what? Because you have faith, you believe the word of God. So if you're a believer, you're acting on the word of God that's been revealed to you. You can only act on the word of God that's been revealed to you. Yeah. You can't act on the whole Bible. You can only reveal on what God, the, the Father, through the Holy Spirit, has revealed to you that's real in you. He needs you to act on that, right? That's right. Okay. And that was, sorry, going back to something that was said uh, a couple weeks ago and that the Lord had said to me, you know, if you took one truth, so you take this truth. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that one truth, get that one truth of righteousness, because it will be a foundation for the next level and the next level and the next level. There we go. All right. So that's the first one. Repentance from dead works. Next one. Faith towards God. Okay. We started this two weeks ago and we asked the question, what is your image of God in your mind and your heart? How do you see him? That's just tied into that. How do you see God? You see him as a big old ogre up there ready to just squash you as soon as you do something wrong? Or do you see a graceful, kind and merciful heavenly father who paid a dear price for you that he could redeem you? put his spirit within you, fill you with his son's love and compassion and nurture you and look after you. Which one do you see of faith towards God? Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says, now he that cometh unto God must believe that he is. Okay, that's that's a no brainer. We, if we're gonna come to him, we gotta believe he's there. But we also must believe that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. There we go. So what's your image of God, right? And can I jump in on this and go into that little, because it's still part of this, and this is going into, can you make yourself love God? <laughs> and, and the reason I'm bringing that in is it's tying in with the whole having your quiet time and having that relationship with God. How you view God is how you are, whether or not you're able to go to him. And have those quiet times. And I'm not going to get too much into this. Because I, I really feel like God's going to do a teaching through this. Uh, and how to hear God. And how to enter into that secret place. And what does that look like? But part of that righteousness. And that is the same principle. When you go to God in your quiet time. You have to use faith. It's not what you feel. It's not whether you're getting the goosebumps in this presence. Am I feeling the presence of God? And then God is there with me. It is the exact same principle coming to God in your quiet time, having your prayer time. Go to him as a person with faith, a person that says, God, I know you love me. And even I don't have to feel you. I know your word says you are there with me. So it's the same thing as putting on that robe of righteousness that we talked about last week. Don't take it off. God doesn't leave you. So he's always there. And I just feel like somebody needs to hear that. When you go into your quiet place, he's there. You don't have to feel it. 
It's not a feeling. And it's also not about going to him with all of your lists of things. Go to him and be with him. Let him just sit and listen to him speak to you. Have a, a stillness in your soul. And that's how we start to communicate with the Father. And what, that's a whole other teaching. And that's one thing that he loves you to come to him about is his word. Yeah. So, you know, you go to him about your word and say, I read this in your word, Father. I, you know what? I don't know how that works, but I need to talk to you about this. How does that look in my life? And whether you hear anything or not, the fact that you're communing with him, he's going to get it back to you. See, right. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive knock and it shall be opened unto you seek and ye shall find and in the original text it means keep on asking keep on knocking and keep on seeking it's not a one-time thing oh i asked god about that and i didn't get anything no 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 you be persistent the word says draw yeah. nigh unto god and he will draw that. nigh to unto you. you and he says that as you draw to me it's showing to the Father our will. Remember that soul that's in the middle. That is our will saying, I want to know you, Father. The minute the Father sees your will wanting to be with him, he draws you near to him. And how does he do that? I love this. He shows you how beautiful he is. And then you fall in love with him. That's the secret place. He shows you how beautiful he is. And then you draw close. Absolutely. It's that process. And it doesn't happen right. It doesn't no, it's, happen it's overnight. A it's a process. It's a process. It's a journey. Nobody is in relationship with the Father because they said a five-minute prayer. Our relationships in human beings aren't like that. We take time. And the Father said to me the other day, and I know I'm going off just for a second, Dave, and then I promise to let Dave go back on. But it's just important because... It was so precious because it's about hearing the Father. And I really feel like to have righteousness, the purpose of knowing that you are righteous is so you can go to the Father, so that you're in right standing with him and you can talk to him. That's the purpose of knowing this righteousness, because out of that, now I can go to God, my Father, and he can open up who he is to me and I can love him more. And then he can show me more things. And he said to me, it's not about how much time you spend with me or how long. He said, but rather how much we share when we are together. If you spend time with a friend for hours and the conversation is meaningless chatter, that time is not more valuable because of the length of time you spent with that person. But if you only spend half an hour and your conversation was deep from the heart and it changed how you felt and it changed how you were thinking, that half an hour is far more valuable than the three hours of meaningless chatter. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we pray carnally. Sometimes we pray out of the flesh because, okay, I'm going to say my prayer and I'm going to do my prayer list and I'm going to say all these scriptures. And we're praying from the flesh. God's wanting to teach us how to pray from the spirit. And he wants us to go deeper because the spirit communes. And that is why we need to know what righteousness is. Righteousness is in the spirit. And it's the same way when we commune with the Father. It's in the spirit. There we go. That's good. That's really good. So back to where we were at. Where were we? You were, you, you, we were you, you, Hebrews you, chapter you're, 6. You went through the foundations and the principles. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we went through repentance from dead work, faith toward God. Now the next one. And of the doctrine of baptisms. What's he talking about? You're baptized into Christ. When you're born again, you're baptized in the water. It's symbolic of a death and resurrection. You went down in the water. You died. You went down an old person, died underwater, came up a new creation in Christ. And then there's the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised. John the Baptist said he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And there's one more baptism that nobody really talks about too much. The baptism of fire, which the Holy Spirit brings on us to bring the burn the junk out of us and empower us to be who we are in Christ. It's a cleansing, beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit does, the doctrines of baptism. So do we understand that? Remember, I'm asking you as we go through this, are you aware of these doctrines? Is your faith and belief in the Father, in the finished work, based on these six principal doctrines? Because everything that you teach and you learn, or anything that you learn has to come through these six doctrines somewhere. These three six teachings will tie into everything that's being taught to you somewhere along the way. 
The next one. And of the laying on of hands. That's a doctrine that Jesus taught. He taught that you lay, he said, go and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's his direct words to his followers when he left and ascended into heaven. There's the laying on of hands for health, for healing. There's the laying on of hands for the impartation of gifts in the spirit from those that are anointed of God to do so, right? There's the laying on of hands. So there's the doctrine about that, about us, what our part is and what God wants to do. Paul said, he talked to Timothy, he said, I long to be with you to lay hands on you again and that I may impart some new gift to you from the Father. I need to equip you with more equipment. So that's a relevant and it's a legitimate thing that belongs to us in the body of Christ. Of the resurrection from the dead. That's number five. And that one is an interesting one. That everyone, you know, when, when, when um, Lazarus died and Jesus came back to raise him from the dead, Martha or Mary, one of them, I think it was Mary come running out and Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe that he will live again? And she said, yes, Lord, we know in the resurrection, everyone will live again. The Jews understood the resurrection. They understood that. But they never really understood the resurrection the way you and I need to understand it. The resurrection of Christ from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead. He was the first one, right? He's the first fruits. And then after him, all of the believers come after that. Every one of us will be resurrected and given a new glorified body. We were resurrected with him. It says we, we were resurrected with him. We're just waiting for that new body to slip into it, right? So the resurrection. But there's one more part of that. Even the unjust will be resurrected and be given their bodies and will stand before the Lord on judgment day in their physical body. Every man that was woman that was created of God will be resurrected in their body and stand before him in the body they were given at the time of creation. They will stand judgment before him. That's, a, that's not a nice one. But those are the, are the resurrections, the doctrine of the resurrections. Resurrection from the dead. And of eternal judgment. That's the final one. That's one of the doctrines of Christ. He taught that if you refuse him, if you refuse the Father, you will go into eternal damnation. That's Jesus' teaching, not mine. These are the six principal doctrines of the body of Christ, of the church. And righteousness is founded and works through all of these, through the knowledge of these, knowing how to deal with each one of these issues in our life. Are you, are you understanding that? It's important. So that's what he said. I could not speak to you as spiritual, but as carnal, because you don't understand these natural things, and I've got to teach them to you again. Okay, you've got an overview of them right now. You understand that a little bit. Some of you a little, some a little more. So we're going to go on in righteousness. The Lord wants you to be established in that. I wanted to go back over to Isaiah 54. I love that one. Isaiah 54, 14. It says this. In righteousness, thou shalt be established. What does that mean, that word established? That means in the original language, in the Hebrew, it means to stand up. It means to stand up, to erect, to make solid, to make firm. Righteousness, basically, if I could say it this way, in righteousness, righteousness will be your spiritual backbone. It will be the strength that holds you up. In righteousness, thou shalt be established. Think about that. And Another word has been in existence for a long time. Because he uses that same word in Proverbs about um, establishing the heavens. So righteousness was from the beginning. God had established us in Christ. He already had a plan from the beginning. In righteousness, thou shalt be. You are going to be. Do you understand that language? When the Holy Spirit wrote that, the Father was speaking. He said, you are going to be established in righteousness. That's going to be your backbone. Yeah. 
And if we don't get that right, we've got no backbone. Because when the enemy comes to attack us, where does he do? He comes to attack your character, your nature, and your works. That's where he comes. He comes after your character, the things that you say and you do. He comes after your works, whether you're serving God or not properly. He comes after all those things. That's how he comes to attack you. And when he comes to attack you, he comes to tell you, you see, look at this. Look what you do. How dare you say you're righteous? How dare you? Yeah. And you say, well, I'm going to tell you something, devil. <clears throat> I am established in righteousness. And I stand in the righteousness of Christ. And I stand in the righteousness of God. So that's how I stand in it. Let's go on and read down into that chapter a little more. We read into it a little more. There, there is one other thing, though, when you before you say that, because um, people will say, well, I, you know, when it is happening and if I am doing something wrong, then I do feel condemned, you know, and shame and guilt and all of that. And um, that is when you have to say there's a scripture that talks about agree with the enemy so that he doesn't find you. And it's about you know, putting a stronghold on you. So you agree with the enemy quickly. So if there's truth in any of those, because the enemy will use partial truths to attack you, agree with them and say, yeah, I might be, and this might not be, uh, I'm not doing everything perfectly, but it's not subject to me. It's subject to the Christ in me. So it's turning it around when you get that kind of attack, when you get that kind of attack on your mind, to confront you on where you are you turn it around you address it you don't try to go okay okay yeah 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 you address it and then you say the truth is you always bring the truth to counter the lie now there's no use denying to the devil when you've done something wrong he knows it and you know it there's no no point you say yeah that's true i did do that but you know what i did devil I went to God and I received cleansing from the blood of the lamb and that sin is not accounted to my account anymore. And it's furthermore, it's none of your business. It's between me and God and yeah. Jesus took care of it. He's my advocate. He's my high priest. So yeah. you can just take your stuff and beat it. That's it. You know, we're not aggressive enough towards that rascal. We let him get away with so much stuff. It's, it's unbelievable. You know, there's something you just said something. In, in, I just brought this up. You asked a question about when you sin. Mm -hmm. This is how you beat the devil. First John chapter five and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God yeah. sinneth not. Oh, how can you say that? I sin all the time. Okay, just a minute. What part of you is born of God? Your spirit. Your spirit, man, cannot sin. So if God looks at you, the Father looks at you, and he says, the core of your being is your spirit because you're joined to me. That's your life force. That makes you my offspring. And your spirit, man, cannot sin. What John's talking about, your spirit, man, is not giving into that. He's not in cahoots with the flesh. So you are not sinning from the spirit. You're sinning in the soul, in the flesh realm. So when the devil comes to you and says, you're not this and you're not that, you say, well, wait, 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 devil. Wait, wait, wait. I got news for you. My spirit is born of God and it can't sin. My flesh made a mistake and I did stupid things. Maybe I wanted to, but it's none of your business because I'm righteous because I'm born of God. And I cannot sin from my core of my being like you did and got yourself kicked out of heaven forever. How do you like that lake of fire coming up there, Mr. Devil? What do you think of that? And, you know, I'm going to go back, and I know we talked about this before, but again, just to balance this out, your spirit is righteous, and it cannot sin. Your flesh can sin. Your soul can sin, because you have a choice and a will. So we're not saying you can't sin, okay? Just I just want to clarify that. What we are saying is, when it comes to the truth about righteousness, you cannot sin, because that's the spirit of God in you. That's his spirit in you. So what do you do when you are sinning and you have sin in your life? There's only one thing always, and it is to repent. So you come to the father and you repent. But I love how Dave is saying this, and this is so important. Take hold of this truth. Don't have these debates with the devil. It's none of his business. 
You go to the father when you have an issue. You go to the father when you're doing something wrong. You don't have debates with the devil about your sin. He's not. That is not the conversation you want to be having because he will always accuse you. He will always convict. He will and always bring condemnation and shame and guilt. Yeah, if you argue you with go him. to the father and you say, Father, I know this is not right and this is in my heart. Because see, here's the thing about righteousness. It convicts you. We talked about that earlier. The righteousness of in the spirit of God in you will convict you. That's where you want to live. You don't want to live dealing with your flesh and the devil. You want to live in your spirit. I hope that helps. Yeah, good stuff. So you understand that. I'm not saying you're sinless because your flesh and your, like Amelia just said, it says you are. But he said, whatsoever of God, born of God, cannot sin. That's from the spirit realm. That's Christ in you. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. That's your life force, right? So you're accountable for what you yield to. If we go back to the Romans chapter eight. We talked about all that months ago and we'll need to go over it again and refresh ourselves. Paul said, whoever you yield yourself to that, that you are servants, whether unto, unto righteousness and to holiness right. or unto sin, unto death. He said, whoever you yield yourself to, that's whose servant you become. Remember that. So these things will all start to tie together. That's why I keep coming back and going over and over and over this. We got to get this rehashed and, and going around and around. And so the Holy yeah. Spirit wants to paint a picture of who you are in Christ and what he has done for you. And at the same time, he's painting a picture of who your father is in heaven and what his desire is and what he thinks about you and how he's looking after you and watching over you. Remember, if you get off into sin and you're goofy enough to do that, we all have been, he will come after you to chasten you and correct you because he loves you. He loves you. It says, whom the father loves, he chasteneth. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Yep. Proverbs 3. It's, he's going to come after us to straighten us out because he loves us, right? So anyway, back to righteousness. Isaiah chapter 54. In righteousness, thou shalt be established. Verse 14. For thou shalt not fear. Fear what? Fear what? Fear that God has abandoned you, cut you off, wants nothing to do with you. That's the biggest fear that a believer ever has. God won't hear me, isn't it? I'm, I'm in desperate need. I need something from God. And the biggest fear that comes to a believer is, I wonder if God heard my prayer. I wonder if he will. I wonder if he'll answer me. It says that you will not fear. Thou shalt not fear. And from terror, you know what terror means? The word terror means anxiety. You won't have anxiety. You won't be freaking out about everything going on around you in your life. It shall not come near you. Now, don't get under condemnation if you're dealing with fear and anxiety right now. The only reason you are dealing with it because you haven't understood and haven't been standing in your righteousness. You need to stand That's up. Right. And that's all. It's That's a right. learning curve and we're going to get there and you're going to do it and you will be standing yeah. up in your righteousness. I'm going to jump in on that. You know, one thing that the Lord showed me not that long ago about that, the whole anxiety and fear and all of that, because there's so many people, and we probably all dealt with it um, and had to walk through that. And the Lord said to me, the reason why, daughter, is because you're trying to control the outcome. So you're in a situation and you're trying to take control of the outcome. And the father says, mm -hmm. This is when I need you to understand that that's what trust is. That is when you trust me because you don't have control of the outcome. You trust the father. And there's a huge free, freeing in your heart and spirit, not your spirit, your soul, because it's your soul that's binding you to that, right? That's causing the fear and the anxiety. Your soul is trying to work it all out. You know, I, I'm going to go back to Proverbs 3, which I love. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not on your own understanding. And the father has been showing me recently everything about that scripture. Trusting him is about everything. And then he says, and then what? I will direct your paths. I will lead you where you need to go. But it always comes back to trusting him. So letting go of those things. So you are not in anxiety and fear. Don't, you're not responsible for the outcome. He is. There we go. That's good. So you shall not fear and from the terror 
which is anxiety, for it shall not come near you. Behold, they shall surely gather together. Who? Who's the they that is going to gather together now? Back in, in the days of Israel and the covenant people, it was all their enemies around them that would gather together. But this scripture is both past, present, and future. Who's going to gather together against you now? Remember, we don't war against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. <laughs> Who's, my blood, blood. Flesh and blood. <laughs> flesh and blood. It sounds something like that. Yeah. We don't war against flesh and blood. Yeah. But against what? Rulers of the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and wicked spirits in heavenly places. Our enemy is the devil and his horde. They are going to gather against you as a saint of God. And they are going to gather against you with lies and accusations. And right now, the flesh and blood can be people in your life. Flesh and blood is people. And the enemy uses people and situations to come against you. But what's behind it are the spirits and the powers and the principalities, right? That yep. are battling you, not people. Now listen, behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. God says, I got nothing to do with this. I'm not sicking them on you. I am not sending a horde of demons to try and teach you something. Get that out of there. Yeah. They don't teach you anything except to smarten up and run to the Father. That's what they should teach you. They shall gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for your sake, because you're righteous. So those demons, like we know that people don't fall around us when they come against us, but those spirits, if we walk with the Lord in the Holy Ghost, in the power of God, the Holy Ghost works against them and the angels work against them, they fall. They are taken out of our life. They shall gather together. They shall fall for thy sake. Remember this. Verse 16 now. Behold, I've created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I have created the waster to destroy. God is reminding you that Satan and all his hordes, but Satan is a created being. He said, I created him. He is not greater than me. So yes. don't be afraid of this guy. Don't let him intimidate you. You are with me. He is not. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, verse 17. Yeah. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that should rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You shall condemn. We talked about this a while ago. You, because your foundation is in righteousness, you're established in righteousness, you know who you are in Christ. When the enemy comes against you, whether it's through people or by the spirit whispering in your ear or circumstances, circumstances are saying things to us all the time too. Poverty, sickness, health, things break down, things don't work, things go the wrong way. They're speaking to you all the time. They're trying to tell you you're on your own and you're going to fail. So they, when they gather against you, to condemn you, you will put them down. You will refute them. You will say, no, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. His righteousness is my righteousness. My father is looking after me and he will get me through this. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Now I went through all that for the last part of this verse in verse 17. Again, one more time. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Yeah. You can't beat that. When he made that quote and he said, Your, their righteousness is of me, there's nothing that can compete against that. When he says, you are made in my righteousness, when he says, the father says, that daughter of mine is righteous, nothing can go against that word. Nothing can challenge that. Amazing. Nothing. When your father says that about you, there is not a creature created by him that has the power to challenge or to overtake that individual. When God says you are righteous, that means I'm with him and he's with me. We're together in this. Don't even think about it. You catching this? Are you getting this? The righteousness that is of faith. Remember, we talked about that. Romans 10, the righteousness which of faith, with is of faith, speaks. It says something. It says, don't say in your heart, Jesus, come down from heaven and rescue me. Or God, raise him up from the dead. You didn't finish the job. But what does it say? 
The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that God has raised him from the dead. And when he raised him, he raised me, and he made me righteous in him. That's what the word of faith says. The word of faith, righteousness says, I'm standing in him. I am invincible. You might kill my body, but you can't touch me. And if I have to leave this place, I'm going to a better place. And I'm not afraid of it. So away we go. Let's get on with the job. Hey, that should excite you. That should make you like just want to jump up and down. That truth right there. How amazing, how amazing God, our Father, is that he's put that in us, himself, himself, his spirit, to bring us through. It's good, it's good, it's good. I, I, there's more I want to get into, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it off here. Yeah, because we started gonna late. Have to, but gonna we have gonna, to end it. We want to have time with everybody at the end of this to chat. But it, it is amazing. Remember. Righteousness is not a feeling. It's right. who you are in Christ. You were born into that in Christ. God is your father, right? Yeah. First Peter says, being born again of the word of God, right? By the incorruptible seed. First John, John said, whosoever is born of God in the spirit realm, you were born of him. The essence of your life comes from God. It's his life in you that is your life now. And it's righteous and pure and holy. Because that's your life force. That's how the Father sees you. And we're going into and we're working through the salvation of the soul. All this that we're dealing with here is all working into the salvation of the soul. Bringing our mind, will, and emotion. Bringing everything back in line in subjection to the Spirit. So they work together like this. Whereas it used to be with the flesh. Now it's going to be with the Spirit. And that's the way we're going. That's we're right. going to walk in faith. So that we are led by the Spirit of the living God. That he placed inside of us and the other part of this righteousness that is also what we talked about is so that we take that truth about righteousness meaning we are in right standing with the father and now we come to the father in our time of prayer we come to him and we spend time with him knowing that we're in right standing with him and the purpose of that is so that we get to know him and we go into a deeper and more intimate relationship with him so that he can show us a greater revelation of who he is. He will show us how beautiful he is so we will fall more and more in love with him. And you know what? All of this is linked. And that's the goal of what we're trying to do is get us to go deeper and to hear the Father for ourselves through his spirit that is dwelling in us. So here's the deal. Amos 3.3. 3. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? We are agreeing with our father from now on about who he says we are in Christ and his righteousness. Isaiah 53. What are we going to say about that? Who has believed our report? Father, we're going to say we are believing your report. We believed your report. And we're going to walk in the truth of what you've done for us in your son. We're going to believe it, Father. We're going to be believers. And we're going to bring glory to your name because we're going to believe your word. We're going to trust in you. And we're going to let your righteousness work out in us all those things that it needs to do. And we're going to become exactly who you wanted us to be before the foundation of the world. We're going to be, according to your word in Romans 8, 29, we're going to be conformed to the image of your son. We're going to be just like Jesus. We're going to be yeah. pleasing to you. And we're going to submit ourselves to you in honor and praise because we love you. And you've revealed yourself to us. Glory, glory, glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, my gosh. And on that, we're going to end. And I'm going to just end in prayer here. Um, just thank you. I'm just excited about the spirit of the living God that lives and dwells in each one of us. Every single one of you that are here listening. Every single one of you that attend. The spirit of the living God is in you and you are righteous. You are in right standing with the father and in right standing with the father. We're going to join together our prayers and we're going to agree together for the truth of the righteousness of Christ abiding in us by the spirit of the living God that brings conviction to our heart. Father, where we need to be convicted. Father, I thank you that you will open up the eyes of our heart, as you said in Ephesians, and enlighten us to the truth and the revelation of who you are. 
Father, that we will have a new desire in this understanding of righteousness to come and draw closer to you. Because your word says that as we draw close to you, you will draw closer to us. And you will open up the eyes of our understanding. And you will show us who you are. So we will fall more and more in love with you. And we will be led by the spirit of the living God. That is the desire of our hearts, Father. Thank you for this time, this, this afternoon. And we bless each and every person that hears this message. Bless them and their families. Watch over them and send forth your ministering angels to carry out the word that you have given us today. Amen. Amen. Bless you.